All right. Um, so um, today, Vince uh, uh, Fior uh, from uh, Rockefeller University will tell us about morphogenesis, mechanics, and malignancy uh, about development of cancer cells uh, in skin. So, Vince, please uh, take yeah. the lead. Fantastic. Um, yeah, pleasure to speak with you all. Please feel free to interrupt um, as we go if there are questions. Um, and I will try to go maybe a bit more rapid because of the late start. But um, yeah, it's a, a pleasure to share the work and hear your feedback. So, I, you know, one of the things that I, really fascinates me is the diversity of forms that biological systems take, and in particular uh, within the human body. If we look at our tissues at the micro scale, at the cellular scale, we we recognize that all these different tissues throughout our body have these different structures, and these structures are intimately linked to their function. How these arise are really still questions that we, what we want to understand. And if we kind of zoom in and think about things at maybe a bit of a conceptual level, uh, what we understand is that the tissues have this arrangement of different cell types in different spaces. So in the middle panel here, I'm showing just cartoons of on the top, the skin and its appendage, the hair follicle, or on the bottom, the intestine and its distinct structure, which includes a crypt and the villus. Villus is where nutrients are absorbed. Crypt is where stem cells reside. And they produce all of the, the other cell types of the tissue. So we, I just color code cells, you know, for, for example, but we can think that, okay, a red cell is different than an orange cell, which is different than a yellow cell. And these cells have different functions. Um, and really the question is how do these cells um, come to uh, be in the right place at the right time? And um, how has that influenced the, the whole function of the tissue? Um, these are big questions, but uh, I think the way kind of I think about it, um, perhaps uh, in engineering terms, is, is there's some sort of uh, a signal and there's some output and uh, there's this black box that the cell interprets the signal and it makes a choice about what, what sort of behavior will, it will undergo, whether it's motility, growth, or death, and this can change the organization of the tissue, and this probably goes back into an iterative feedback loop sort of manner to, to ultimately give rise to these complex architectures. And one of the important things to think about is that um, each cell state, so how in what, say, flavor of cell you um, exist in at any given time, probably colors the, um, this input-output relationship. So what do we know about this process? We know quite a bit about how uh, tissues change their shape, and a lot of this comes from work in uh, simple uh, model organisms such as the Drosophila, which is a, a monolayered epithelium um, showing here uh, the, the, uh, the, the ectodermal cells here that will give rise to these uh, folds, these dorsal folds, which is one of the, one of the um, uh, say prototypical uh, mechanisms of shape change that that have been observed and so how does this happen there's I would say two major mechanisms that have been described um, quite quite uh, abundantly in the literature which are um, ideas of differential growth and differential tension so in differential growth to um, to uh, uh, tissues or two structures that are growing at different um, rates will give rise to uh, um, uh, potentially deformations within a confined area. Or you can just have growth, uh, you know, like extended growth within an unconfined space that will give rise to, to uh, shape change. The other is uh, differential tensions. And this has been widely described in the context of actomyosin contractility, where say, uh, if we're looking at a monolayer, the apical side of a cell might contract and change its shape um, 
say, um, uh, preferentially to the basal side, and this can give rise to shape changes like these dorsal folds that are seen here. <clears throat> um, so these are really, these are ubiquitous mechanisms throughout the animal kingdom, um, and they've really been largely studied in simple epithelia. Uh, but some questions that um, have been really uh, um, instrumental to my work is what other mechanisms could there be? Um, as we know that there's really a diversity of architectures that of tissues that are seen throughout more higher order complex um, mammalian animals. Lastly, I'll just say that this, uh, this architecture is important because um, one of the hallmarks and maybe, maybe the the sinful known characteristic of cancer is a loss of normal tissue architecture. And so um, we see uh, in this schematic here on, uh, on the screen that as, um, as cancers initiate and then progress to a real um, uh, problematic state, a normal architecture, say of this epithelium, where you have um, cells at the bottom, which are different from cells at the top, that really gets destroyed and disorganized and understanding that process is, uh, we think, very important to understanding cancer. So some of these overarching questions are, what are biophysical drivers of these tumor architectural changes? Um, do these changes influence tumor progression? And if so, how? And um, are, say, similar developmental mechanisms that we're, um, that we're learning about, are they co-opted during tumor genesis? Or are there similar mechanisms between tumor genesis and normal tissue development? <clears throat> so my work um, in the past few years has focused on the skin as a model um, tissue. And this is a very, uh, I think we think, interesting tissue not only for its relevance in terms of um, disease and, and homeostasis of humans, but also its, um, its inherent architectural features. Um, what I'm gonna tell you about today is um, how cancers uh, arise in the skin. And one of the things that really interested me when I joined um, a lab here at Rockefeller that focused on skin is that uh, normally, you have this architecture that's um, what we call a complex epithelium. There's uh, cells at the base of the tissue that give rise to all of the differentiated cell layers above it. When those cells, what we call basal cells, when they get a mutation that can confer cancer, um, they give rise to two distinct um, shapes in terms of um, the 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 pre, what I'll call pre-malignant lesions. So before they totally invade the tissue and become really problematic, they have two um, different shapes. And those are schematized here. So if a, if a basal cell gets a mutation in the hedgehog pathway, it gives rise to uh, what are called basal cell carcinomas. And what I realized was that they have these distinct um, features in terms of their shape, which we'll, we've termed budding, and I'll describe that more on the next slide. Whereas if a basal cell gets a mutation in the RAS or MAP kinase pathway, they give rise to pre-malignant lesions that we term folding. Um, they, they both originate from those basal stem cells, but they drive distinct tumor architectures and uh, it really wasn't clear why. Importantly, however, these two um, cancer-causing mutations give rise to very different prognoses and outcomes in terms of tumor progression. So while BCCs or basal cell carcinomas are rarely uh, um, really invasive and metastatic, uh, squamous cell carcinomas um, are. And so this kind of set up a, a nice question for us to try to ask the question of, how do these distinct architectures arise and might they be important for tumor progression? Um, so to study this, we set up a, a system where we could uh, introduce these lesions within the skin of mice and follow the growth uh, 
and morphology of these uh, lesions over time. And so to do this, we, uh, I'll spare some of the details, but we inject lentivirus into the amniotic sacs of, of mice. This will infect the earliest layer of cells they see, which happens to be those basal cells. Um, <clears throat> We can then, by using this method, introduce any uh, variety of oncogenic um, or genetic changes to those cells in a mosaic fashion. Um, so in this case, we are, we're introducing um, uh, these cancer-causing mutations, which are in the background of the mouse, um, either HRAS or smoothened uh, through a through cremated excision of their floxed alleles. Um, the power of the system is we can also introduce other types of genetic alterations like knockdown of a specific gene of interest or cDNAs to overexpress genes. Um, and so uh, this gives rise to these, um, these uh, distinct folds, which uh, features, which I'll um, characterize um, by um, these, these morphometric features, but uh, let, me, let me show you first that this works. So if we introduce these mutations, we'll give rise to, if we introduce a mutation in the hedgehog pathway, which I'll abbreviate as SMO or SMOM2, which is a, um, which um, um, the details aren't critical, but that will be an activating mutation in the hedgehog pathway. We get these budded-like features and if we introduce a mutation in the RAS MAP kinase pathway, we get these folded features. And so um, I'll characterize them by um, a few different morphometric uh, parameters, but what we, what we decided was a very uh, easy, non-dimensional way to parameterize the system was this shape factor, S, which is essentially the indentation depth of the, of the growth from the basal plane of the tissue um, over the curvature radius of the distal tip of that tissue. Um, and so uh, these look, these look um, in our system, if you let them develop, they look like the, the lesions that we see in humans. <clears throat> and so he, and the, the morphometric parameters are here. So, so we see that there's differences in uh, indentation depth where these budded SMO, SMO lesions invade a little bit further, have a very have a much smaller curvature radius, and that gives them a higher shape factor compared to the RAS folds. Um, so, so that so I'll say that the take home here is that um, for this shape factor S, these budded lesions that we get from 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 hedgehog pathway activation are of a high shape factor. And these folded lesions that we get from RAS MAP kinase uh, pathway activation have this low shape factor. Okay, so this was the system that we we set up, and we wanted to try to start to understand, you know, how how are these different um, architectures being driven? <clears throat> um, one of the first things we looked at was proliferation, as these are uh, oncogenic uh, mutations. So if we look at how quickly cell cycle once they've been activated with the mutation, what we find is that not surprisingly, um, the smoothen, uh, the BCCs and the SECs, um, which I'll use for, for shorthand, but I think BCC is um, the smoothen activating uh, mutant and the SEC is this RAS activating mutant. In both cases, cell proliferant cell proliferation is activated. And interestingly, we see that um, the density of cells within these mutant clones is elevated, um, as are some of their shape parameters, like the aspect ratio of a cell is actually increased. So these cells are getting kind of packed in within these clones, their density is increasing, and they're becoming more columnar. Um, they also experience this anisotropy actually um, around the periphery. But this was all um, kind of well expected um, within the, and, and has been demonstrated within the literature as, as a function of um, uh, growth within a confined um, space. So basically we have cells, they're proliferating higher than their neighbors, and so they're experiencing these um, 
these um, um, compressive forces that are that are changing their shape and density. Um, does this is this what's giving rise to differences between these architectures? As we see it in really in both cases, to do this we we derived a, a functional genetics experiment to try to test this, which is if we diminish the proliferation of cells within these mutant tissues, um, do we change the architecture of these lesions, uh, i.e. Do, do we make a, a bud into a fold or vice versa? And the answer is no. So what we see is that actually when we decrease the proliferation rate of cells within these mosaic tissues, the main, the main um, take home that we see, what the effect we see is actually, of course, the growth area of the individual clones diminishes. And this is just by titrating the amount of the cell cycle inhibitor within the tissue, um, as does the indentation um, depth or general deformation of these lesions within the tissue. So in a dose dependent manner, if you decrease proliferation, you decrease the growth um, of these lesions and you decrease their ability to deform the out of plane of the, of the, of the normal uh, epithelial plane, but we don't see changes in, um, this is, I should say, this is the same irrespective of the, the mutation that's being activated. So this kind so, of told us- uh, Vince, what about the shape factor? So indentation depth uh, sort of clear that uh, it decreases, uh, but uh, what about shape factor? Yeah, so okay, so good, good question. And the, uh, the answer is that, uh, uh, well, uh, the shape factor actually, um, it diminishes slightly for both cases. But it doesn't. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't switch the architecture from a budding to folding. So, so the, the shape factor will de diminish slightly as a function of decreasing indentation depth. But it's not. Uh, it's not uh, the drastic. It's not what is changing or or dictating budding or folding. Great, thank um, you. Yeah, but that's a good question. So what about, uh, so, so it seems like differential growth is certainly happening and we think that's what's, you know, the important thing for driving these deformations, right? You need the growth to actually get out of plane def um, um, deformation, but, but not the, the difference in uh, shape. Uh, what about differential tension? <clears throat> um, this would be another hypothesis. Uh, so to do this, we did um, what are pretty classic experiments. We do a laser ablation uh, at the junctions, in this case, either within a mutant clone, at the periphery of a mutant uh, clone and wild type cells, or say it just normal wild, wild type, wild type um, neighbors. <clears throat> and what we find is that, um, and so this is quite a bit of data, but I'll, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll walk through the, what are the most important parts. Um, if you look at, excuse me, Vince, uh, could you explain a little more detail? What is the effect of laser ablation? Uh, how does it uh, in yeah. influence the, the tension? Yeah, great, great. So the, I, the idea here is that we'll bisect a junction. Uh, it's kind of schematized here with the red dotted line. And then we'll follow the, the uh, vertices of two junctions and we'll see how they change in there position over time. <clears throat> the, the idea is that it, as there's more tension on a junction, their displacement over time increases at a faster, uh, at a higher rate uh, or velocity than a junction that has lower tension on it. So this is purely a way to measure whether there is uh, differential tensions on junctions within these mutant clones. There are some caveats to this, which, um, which is basically, you know, are how are the material properties, let's say, of the tissue slightly affected um, between these cases, which, which could also uh, influence retraction velocity. But for a good, for first proxy, these very initial reaction velocities um, um, 
you know, seem to be a, uh, a pretty well accepted and, uh, and pretty robust measure of, of tension on a junction. Essentially, you cut it and you see how fast it, it, it moves apart. If you look at mutant, uh, mutant junction, so, so the junction between two mutant cells, in both smooth and aras, it's very low. Um, and uh, we think this is because as these cells are compacting together, basically their tensions, their, 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 um, their um, lateral tensions are being diminished. <clears throat> this is compared to two wild type cells that are distal to a clone where they, where they actually do have a retraction velocity. That is, that is uh, quite substantial. The, the, the interesting thing here was that if you look at the retraction velocity between a mutant wild type cell and a wild type wild type cell within the smoothened um, uh, mutant um, tissue, there we do see a significant difference in the retraction velocity between these two cell types. So this really does suggest to us that at the edge of these mutant clones, there is this differential tension that could perhaps be giving rise to, um, to that shape. Whereas in the case of RAS, we don't see a difference in the interfacial tension between a wild type mutant cell and a mutant and a wild type wild type cell. Oh, uh, Wings, uh, can we also conclude from this that uh, mutant cells uh, um, push on the wild type cells uh, in this picture? So basically, uh, there is a tension uh, more uh, in the uh, non-mutant tissue, right? Yes, yes, this is correct. This is correct. So, so if you look at, uh, and, and yeah, yeah, so within the center of the clone, there's compressive forces. Uh, within the, at the periphery of the, of the clone, there's, um, there's uh, extensile uh, forces, um, if that if that makes sense. Um, yeah. What else? Yeah. If you looked at a wild type cell right next to the mutant clone, there you would also um, be ex um, experiencing these differences in compression and tension, this pushing of mutant on wild type cells. Um, in these cases where we're looking at these wild type cells, they're actually quite distal to the clone. So we wanted to have a condition where um, um, it's kind of the the base case, if you will. Um, so um, uh, I should also say that there is this slight trend where it, in totally wild type tissue, it is a bit elevated, um, though not statistically from, from the in the mutant tissue, which again gets to that point. This was corroborated by if you look, if you stain for things like actin and myosin, which are these major um, force generating um, components of the tissue. If we look at the border of uh, these smoothened uh, clones, you can see these differences in concentration of these molecules that we don't see in wild type or in the RAS um, case. And this is quantified here. So, so indeed it seems like um, the smoothened uh, lesions, they, uh, they, uh, exhibit differential um, interfacial tensions that are um, driven by actomycin. Um, at this point, uh, and uh, throughout the rest of my talk, I will be going kind of back and forth between um, simulation and experiment, which hopefully I think for the audience will be um, some, some of the, the, the really interesting uh, points of the work. Because yeah, maybe I should have prefaced this. Obviously, th there's a lot going on within these this tissues in vivo, so it's quite a complex system. Um, but uh, and we're able to make these genetic manipulations. But still, if if we want to try to maybe gain from some first principles what we think is going on, uh, we thought it would be very uh, very beneficial to have a, um, a simulation component to see how. How, how well we were with our hypotheses and our measurements compared to, to what we could 
um, actually derive from first principles. So um, at this point, uh, I'll introduce you to the, the vertex model, which hopefully um, most are familiar with, but this is essentially describing the tissue with cellular resolution as um, uh, with really two, two um, terms at this point um, that describe the work uh, uh, the work uh, of the tissue that we that we minimize, which is this uh, cell incompressibility term, and these active line tensions um, that are that are at the, the, the interface between these cells. Um, so so this so incompressibility we have we have this this um, um, constant that is quite high. Cells don't like to be incompressible. Uh, so, so this is essentially say, saying cells aren't going to disappear into nothing. They are going to maintain their their um, their their area in this case, and uh, the line tension saying that um, this this gamma term um, can describe uh, some some differential tension or force on these junctions between cells, like we had measured actually in the real tissue. The in, the cool thing about this model is that. Like the skin is, these uh, we we built this model in this multi-layered fashion, such that there's these blue cells at the bottom, which are the proliferative cells. Uh, in in a normal case, um, if we introduce a mutation, then that actually is going to drive this differential proliferation between the mutant and basal cells, um, and it's only the basal cells that'll proliferate. But they can rearrange their junctions. They can move. Um, they can move um, upwards in the tissue, and eventually, um, within this this um, bounded box, they'll give rise to uh, tissue deformations. Uh, so hopefully, any if there's any questions, please please. Um, yes, I, I wonder. Uh, but uh, this in this vertex model, the number of vertices is not fixed. Uh, is it right? So it's no. not all no, it's hexagonal. Not. hexagonal. No. So, so you don't use all hexagonal cells, right? No, no, it's not all hexagonal. And as the simulation runs, cells grow, divide, and um, once they reach a certain uh, area, we bisect them, and so then they give rise to two to two cells. Um, um, one, yeah. So not all perfect hexagonal. And um, also, yeah, the, the number, there's the, these junctions are constantly rearranging as more cells are added throughout the simulation. Um, so if we run the simulation and we, uh, now I'll show you for cases where we're, we're driving different tensions between the mutant and wild type cells, as we observed in the smoothing case, what is the effect? What is the Sorry, effect? Sorry, Vince, uh, sh do, do you already show the, the video? No, here, uh, ah, let, sorry, me, sorry. let me let me see if... Yeah, it runs, it runs. It runs, okay. okay. So, so, and I'll run it a few times, but basically on the top, there's no difference in tension between the mutant and wild type cells. And as we move downward, we are increasing this parameter, this um, gamma parameter. Um, to a case where uh, at the bottom it's actually quite super physiologic, but we did want to explore the parameter space. And the middle is what we what we actually um, we we measure in the tissue. So if I run it again, essentially what we can see is yeah, cells are dividing, uh, rearranging, and in in all cases um, we're uh, arriving to this um, this really a, a budded shape that that looks most like um, the smoothen lesions. So this for us was quite interesting, which essentially told us that, well, um, in this case, where we're just having cells divide um, and we're having uh, um, this multi-layered model, um, whatever parameters, uh, the system is always giving rise to these budded shapes. So. So while we have this differential tension in the smooth and lesions, which is associated with budding, it's really, um, we're still not able to figure out what is different between the budded and folded architecture. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, th- so this was kind of one of yeah, the outcome. I, I mean, it didn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't solve our problem of what was distinguishing the two. Um, and the, the main features that we do see is that you, you tend to see these cells um, become more excluded from their neighbors as their tensions um, get higher. So this was, and, and uh, yeah. Um, and this is, I will say, very different from what we know about in a simple monolayer epithelium. So in this case, uh, we're running the simulation, um, increasing the tension either on the base or uh, the basal side or the apical side of the tissue. And here we do really get uh, a diversity of shapes like uh, just periodic folds or these kind of more um, apical or basally oriented um, um, folded structures. And this is known throughout the literature for a long time that really all you need is these differences in tension uh, at a junction to get a real uh, pretty, um, pretty large diversity of shapes. So uh, clearly there was something about the multilayer aspect of the tissue that was, that was um, different in, in, in being able to generate a diversity of shapes. Uh, it's, and this is just this is just shown here. Um, this is just the, a graph of these results, where um, uh, we're showing. Sorry, uh, I'm showing the the result of shape factor from our in silico simulations for a variety of of interfacial tension parameters. And you really you see that indeed the shape factor is not tr- uh, changing dramatically, and it's not getting us to distinguish between these two uh, mutants. Uh, the last thing uh, we did was we did indeed do a, a genetic um, manipulation of this where we knocked down myosin within these uh, smoothened lesions, which is the main, this is the main isoform that uh, is generating these actomyosin tensions. And while, again, uh, we see this uh, subtle decrease in shape factor, which actually uh, we, we predict from the in silico um, as well, it's really still, it's not, um, it's not drastically changing the shape. So um, we can see the differential tension is involved, but it's not dictating the difference between the, the buds and folds. So what is? Um, we kind of then took an agnostic approach. We decided to isolate these cells between uh, these um, smoothened or RAS embryos and see what kind of molecules are differentially expressed. Maybe that gives us a clue. And this is where uh, we were quite excited by the fact that we found that the most highly uh, enriched terms, if you compared smoothened uh, to RAS um, mutants, were uh, genes involved in extracellular matrix. And in particular, this specialized extracellular matrix um, that's um, the, the basement membrane. So just a very quick, a very quick um, background on this basement membrane is this this polymer network that underlies epithelial cells. It's this uh, network of laminin and collagen molecules that really provides this structural uh, separation between epithelia and mesenchyme. Um, And these networks can can additionally be cross-linked to change their biophysical properties by by a certain um, uh, number of uh, accessory molecules. Um, and in the skin, um, this, this membrane connects to the epithelial cells through these uh, specific adhesion components, uh, and, and they're termed hemidesmosomes. Um, the, the interesting thing was that the, you know, really, we know a lot about what, how these proteins behave biophysically by purifying them from tissue, maybe self-assembling them in vitro and measuring their properties but what is the what were the biophysical properties of these networks really in the in vivo tissue was um, largely still a mystery when we started this work. So, so that was what we set out to do next. Ah, first, first I'll, I'll describe the model, the modeling aspect of it, and then we'll go into the the measurements. Um, so then in the model, we implemented, we basically implemented um, terms for the uh, stiffness, so both the stretching and bending modulus of the basement membrane, um, as well as a time scale for remodeling or se- assembly um, 
which um, it, um, I'll talk about more in general, but basically how quickly is the, this basal um, membrane adapting to um, the growth time scale of the cell. So how quickly does that, when a cell is growing, how quickly does that, uh, does that membrane grow with it? Um, I hope that's, that makes sense. Um, but okay, so let me show some of the simulations. Um, and, and so here's where we, we started to get excited as we could see really getting a more diversity of shapes by including the material properties of this basement membrane. Um, and here, if we look at the full kind of spectrum, uh, stiffness on the Y and assembly on the X axis, we see that by varying these parameters, we, we get a quite rich, um, rich spectrum of, um, of, um, um, of, of shapes where you really need a high uh, bending modulus to get folded type architectures. A lower modulus is giving rise to um, 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 buds and uh, really with, with high assembly rates, um, we get these budded features um, to, to dominate. Uh, sorry, uh, Wins, uh, can you uh, comment a little about the model? So tau mm -hmm. is, a, is the characteristic time of uh, in, in your model, and uh, lambda what, uh, is connected uh, connecting the area, right? Yes, correct, exactly, yep. Exactly. So, the, so it, with respect to the previous model that you discussed, uh, it, the area term, the, the effect of the area of the cell is still included, but through this uh, uh, lambda times square root of uh, thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Correct. Uh, and so, uh, it's not clear how how is the bending uh, included in a way? Uh, how do you what is C? Is, the, is it the curvature? Uh, C is the, yes, correct, the curvature um, of the, uh, of, uh, yeah, curvature of this local, uh, yeah, the local, the, the element, yes. Yeah. yeah, and then, uh, what, so B, what is B? So B is our uh, bending modulus, which, you know, we show for, for thin, for thin film, really bending is, is dominating over stretching. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that is our, that is our, our characteristic bending modulus of the, of that network. Okay. And then um, uh, what of uh, all these uh, quantities, so you can uh, measure bending modulus in tissues experimentally, uh, like a curvature, you already explained that you have been measuring to determine the shape factor. Mm -hmm. Is it correct. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. So on. So now I'll I'll get to the um, to the measurement of of modules. But yes, this this is the good the good point. So um, so it was we did have to devise a way to actually measure the local um, uh, bending modulus, or we we use actually small indentation and Young's modulus and um, and convert to to um, uh, it really is a, a good proxy for the, for bending modulus in this case, but essentially we use a, a atomic force microscopy to to once we separate the epidermis from the basement membrane, we can go and locally measure the mechanical properties of this tissue, which I'll, uh, just is schematized here, but uh, is 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 it was a headache, but uh, we were we were able to do it. We find is that the basal membrane is much stiffer than the underlying dermis or the stroma. So we think by first proxy, that's the most you know stiff mechanically uh, important element of of this uh, tissue. And as the model predicted, if you look at the uh, smoothen lesions, actually those have a lower um, uh, modulus whereas the RAS folds have a higher modulus. If we look at the, these proximal regions versus the distal tips, actually they have a high modulus 
modulus, even higher modulus, which uh, I'll, if I have time, I'll get into I think, describing why we think that is. But essentially, at least to a first approximation, the model correctly predicted that uh, you have a lower bending modulus, lower uh, modulus in the smoothing case versus in the RAS case. Um, so is this really important? Does this influence um, the shape architecture of these tissues? Well, again, we use a functional approach to basically vary the, the modulus by knocking down components of the basement membrane. If we knock down a, a collagen um, um, uh, uh, trimer um, uh, molecule, we decrease the modulus. If we knock down uh, a pro, one of these proteoglycans, we can actually increase the modulus. And if we knock down a um, cross-linking uh, enzyme, we can also decrease the modulus, although uh, to, to a bit lesser extent. So we went in and then measure the, the effects of these knockdowns on the tissue. And uh, we, I'll just kind of um, point your attention to the quanti quantification here. But here we do see that indeed, if we knock down um, this, the, uh, if we change the stiffness, we can affect the shape of these tissues uh, in a way that is um, kind of consistent with the model, where if we decrease uh, the stiffness, we increase the uh, shape factor. Uh, and if we increase the stiffness, we, can, we decrease the shape factor. And this is actually the trend is similar for both for both um, for both types uh, of lesions, and so uh, it seems like this modulus is indeed important in driving the shape. But but we're not all the way there in terms of describing what is different uh, or what is what is really um, the distinguishing features of these two. But we're but we're I think we're getting close. So the, the, the last thing I, um, I mentioned was this, which was that uh, assembly of the basin membrane is important. So we went to, um, we went to investigate this. Um, essentially, uh, if we look at types of molecules that are incorporated either in a, an actively, um, actively assembling basin membrane versus a more mature basin membrane, these are enriched within these distal tips of smoothened uh, buds versus folds. Um, we derived an, an assay to actually measure this in an explant. So ex vivo, we can take these tissues, we can culture them with just a small amount of fluorescently labeled um, basement membrane molecules and see how quickly they get incorporated into the existing basement membrane. And what we find is that Indeed, a high basement membrane assembly is, um, is uh, characteristic of these smoothened buds. Uh, lastly, if we knock down laminin to decrease basement membrane assembly, uh, we actually diminish the uh, shape factor of these, um, of these um, tissues, which is, again, what the model uh, predicted. So, uh, so here uh, I'll kind of describe what, what, what we really, um, in, in, in measuring uh, and varying both the stiffness and the assembly of the basement membrane, um, we found that, <clears throat> again, we were able to um, quite uh, uh, describe the morphometry of these lesions in, in ways that really I think started to make a lot of sense. So if we uh, look at uh, these regions here with a very, so here uh, shape factor is uh, in, in a heat map scale here. So you really, you get these um, high shape factor um, uh, lesions where we have a high assembly rate and uh, moderate to low stiffness. Um, the shape factor decreases as we decrease assembly um, rate of the basement membrane, and it also decreases 
as we um, increase the stiffness. And so this was really, um, this is, um, you know, quite um, uh, consistent with, with the results of our experiments. Yeah, uh, uh, Finz, I just want to warn that uh, in five minutes we should go to the uh, uh, question session. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to skip through uh, a, a part here and I'll get to the conclusions and I think, uh, yeah, we can do uh, questions and discussion. Um, and I think that would be the most, uh, most fruitful. And I'll just go to a, a summary slide, which will kind of, um, yeah, I think get us there. But essentially what we did was there's one, there's one more aspect that is important here. So we, we did uncover that these tumors, what I'll call tumor specific basement membrane mechanics are important in dictating these, uh, tumor architectures, um, as is a tumor specific cell differentiation program, which, um, I'll, I'll just get into the summary of that on the net, on the final slide. So I'll skip all that and I'll tell you, and I'll just tell you all the summary, which is that the architecture we think really is dictated by, um, interactions between expansive forces, which are driven by the proliferation of those basal cells. The assembly dynamics and stiffness of that basement membrane that I talked, talked about, and also the material properties of the super basal cells. Um, and this is due to their differential uh, differentiation program and the expression of keratin molecules. Um, and just to describe it, um, Briefly, it is that um, as these uh, cells, as they differentiate and, and uh, move upwards, they actually change their material properties as well, which, will all, uh, which influences the, the folding versus budding uh, shapes of the tissue. Um, this, uh, these mechanisms, at least these, these last two, um, thinking about basement membrane and, uh, super basal cells, these are distinct from super simple epithelia where, where, um, where it's really been shown that this differential actomyosin tension is what's driving things. Um, although what we find is that actomyosin tension does kind of further quantitatively or subtly alter these architectures, which we could think maybe they're really critical in normal morphogenesis. Um, and, um, and what I didn't uh, have time to talk about, but we think is really important, which is that actually the tension, the, the extensile um, strain that's uh, experienced by this basement membrane is elevated in a case where we have lower assembly of basement membrane and stiff superbasal cells, which is exactly what we see within these squamous cell carcinomas that are more prone to invasion and basement membrane breakdown. So we think this could be a, a new mechanism by which this basement membrane is actually disrupted during tumor genesis and, and leads to uh, worse prognosis. Um, so just kind of uh, getting back to, uh, to the general kind of questions, you know, I think that really these networks, um, them being the, the, the extracellular matrix, the, the, the base membrane, and these uh, cytoskeleton, these in particular intermediate filaments are really key, key networks, key drivers of how this, um, this, um, what I'll call, call mechanotransduction uh, kind of feedback loop um, uh, arises to give these different tissue architectures. And I think we've kind of at least understood a bit of, about how different architectural diversity can arise due to the nature of a, a complex versus a simple epithelium. And that is really this combination of, of basin membrane and differentiation um, of those supervasal cells that expands this architectural diversity. Um, so with that, I'll take questions. And if we want to go back through any parts of the data itself, um, I'm happy to, but I'd just like to acknowledge um, Elaine Fuchs, who's my uh, uh, 
uh, postdoctoral mentor here at Rockefeller, uh, contributors um, in particular, uh, Mete Pronk, who um, was at uh, Princeton during the time of this work in the lab of Stop Schwarzman, who were really the drivers of the, the simulations and the, um, the uh, computational work, as well as other collaborators that were involved in the study. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, thank you, uh, Vince. All right, we, uh, because of the uh, yeah. uh, late start, we'll take a few questions over <laughs> for the time that was allocated yeah. and for the talk. Uh, so um, if anyone wants uh, to ask a question, uh, you're free to connect your audio microphone, uh, to connect your microphone and ask. Uh, otherwise, if you have issues with your microphone, you can also uh, type in the chat. All right. Uh, just while uh, the audience the, <laughs> uh, thinks of the question, I will ask uh, a question of my own. Um, so you mentioned at the end of the talk is that uh, while uh, the cancer uh, tissue proliferates and uh, it may also, some uh, layers of this uh, tissue may change properties. So they will have uh, different, uh, so does it mean that they will have different uh, like bending modulus and other mechanical properties that you need for your simulation model? Uh, is it correct? And if it is correct, what is the uh, mechanism that drives this change? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll just um, show a bit of um, the data. But yeah, essentially it's just that. Uh, um, one of the things that we noticed was if we look, so this is doing this RNA-seq, right? And looking at different genes and how they're expressed. One of the, the other things, so I showed you what was really highly expressed in the smoothing case, which was these extracellular matrix proteins. What's highly expressed in the RAS case are these, uh, we call them, they're differentiation genes of the skin, but it's essentially those, these, these proteins that make up the barrier. And that barrier, the outside of our skin, obviously needs to be robust um, mechanically um, to, to you know, keep water in and keep microbes and such mm -hmm. out. And so this is, again, one of the major differences between these two, um, between these two states. And what uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I guess to a more, it's, these are like, you know, these looking at different keratin molecules, which, which are known to be um, important for this making the barrier. But if we just think about the material properties, again, now we could go in and actually measure these with AFM, uh, looking at the layers, and we see that it's really quite beautiful. You see this fast. Um, change in the material properties of those cells as you move upwards in the layer. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, basically what, it's like your skin gets harder as, as it, uh, at, further outside of your body so that, you know, you kind of have a, a nice barrier at the, at the surface. Um, and uh, this, this also happens in the tumor. So, so to, so to answer the question, there is this change in material properties. Uh, it seems to be due to just this normal process of barrier formation that the stem cells undergo. I see. Thank you. All right. Um, do we have uh, questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have some questions. Why is it important to study the architecture of skin cancer? If it's for, is it for to define the stages of all the skin cancer, is it to, pre to provide the medical treatment or what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. So, yes, I mean, at the end of the day, what we do uh, what we do want to uncover is kind of novel mechanisms of how cancer progresses and uh, it, whether it's, you know, skin cancer per se, or whether these are more generalizable principles to other forms of cancer, 
um, that's, you know, that's like the next set of questions and where we want to go. But, but we, we really, you can think about how these principles uh, can inform mechanisms of progression and how it depends on the architecture of the normal tissue. So, so there's multiple multi-layered complex epithelia within the body. We'd like to know whether these same mechanisms are at play within those, those tissues. Um, but the bottom line is just that, yes, uh, we, we still don't have uh, um, mechanisms to stop even that initial process of barrier breakdown, the basement membrane, and stopping cells from, from spreading from, from that initial primary tumor site. So um, yeah, the goal is to, to actually use these findings to inform, um, uh, to inform treatment strategies. Although, I, I mean, we can talk about what they are. They're, they're, not, uh, they're, they're not easy, but that's what we're thinking about. Yeah, well, I, I would add that uh, to Boris' uh, question that, uh, first of all, uh, architecture is very important also in the design of uh, drug delivery systems. So uh, one of the things is uh, that uh, when you treat the cancer, uh, you need uh, uh, to ensure that drugs that need to, that fight the cancer will, uh, will be delivered there and uh, diffused through these tissues. So uh, architecture of those uh, cancer um, uh, is important uh, for, for uh, designing cures and med medications. Mm, that's, um, that means when, when we find the, the architecture, we know uh, exactly almost the kind of treatment we are going to apply to the skin. Uh, yeah, well, uh, it, th there are so there are uh, several questions uh, to that. Okay, first uh, there are there is a, a search for uh, drugs uh, uh, and drug delivery. So for that you need to know mechanical properties of the tissues and uh, 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 architecture. Uh, but there is also a question: uh, why this uh, right? Uh, why why this? Uh, uh, cancer uh, form this uh, architecture, uh, these uh, features in the skin. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, so, so to answer your question, I mean, this this is new. So, what we do know is that when when a pathologist would go for a cancer look at skin cancer, let's say specifically, they would see okay, it's got this budded histology or this folded histology. Uh, or at some maybe later stage of that, but really then they will classify them as two different cancers and they'll, they will treat them differently. Um, you know, again, when we set out to start this, we didn't know why they looked different. Um, but, you know, now that we understand that and what some of the, the kind of constraints are that drive these different shapes, I think, you know, Nobody, we don't have the treatment that says, okay, we need more basement membrane assembly in this brass driven um, uh, squamous cell carcinomas, which again, before we even identified the, the, the cancer causing gene, we, we, we treated them differently. Uh, but uh, now that we know that, you know, that, that would be the goal is to, yeah, we're working on some screens to try to increase the expression of these important molecules that help to halt the, the next stage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you do have another question, Boris? Yes, I have the last one. Yeah, go, even if it's not. Uh, can you, can you go, go back in your slide where you show the, the, the in the figure, you have four figures, starting by the initial point of skin cancer. Uh, sorry, can, can you, you go back? Yeah, could you say it's, again to, to, to where? Is it in the figure, I think it's the third slide, I think. A video though? No, 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 no. The beginning of the presentation? Yeah. About slide number 10, Vince. What? Oh, just... 
I'll just keep clicking. You can say. No, no, it's, it's, it's before. It's before. 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 Yeah. Go back. No, that's the second slide. Ah, no. It's, move forward is not here. This is. Could you just um, formulate the question without the slide? Yes, the, 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 the problem is in the figure, he, he used two, two rules. One is like reversible. And I would like to know if, if I move from the beginning of the, the, the skin cancer, that means the, the first stage, and move from the, the second stage card, is it possible to go back to the, ah. uh, to the first stage? Because in the figure, I ah. have two I think, rows. I think you want this kind of schematic, maybe. Uh, it, okay. Yes. But yes. yeah, yes. So, <clears throat> the the row because here you use two row. You have, for instance, mill stage and moderate stage. Can we move from the moderate stage to the mill stage? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think in principle, those are those are the ideas that. Uh, that uh, that we're trying to explore, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, clearly you can. So clearly you can push, uh, obviously one thing is to eliminate the tumor cells, but then to push, um, push those cells to say differentiate, differentiation therapy to promote them to kind of uh, be removed from the tissue through normal means. Um, is uh, a, you know a potential way to move from say a disease state back to a more normal tissue architecture so i think if that's if that's the question is how can we and how can we um that would be an example of of an approach but i think we're you know we're still a long way from actually being able to do that uh, but but that would be a goal obviously you know if it's if it's a tumor that you're able to see and operate on then you remove it but if it's not and it's you know say small or it's you know there are many many of them then you do have to find a way to um to get rid of the the tumorigenic tissue while still maintaining the normal tissue um yeah thank you thank you um other questions do we have Not at the time. Uh, okay, just 